Welcome everyone to Paranormal Roundtable. I'm your host, Josh Turner. PRT, that's what we call the show for short, and we call our listeners the Paratroopers. Uh, it's not a name I came up with. Um, some listeners came up with that. Uh, before we get started tonight, I wanted to say something. Uh, folks, uh, Paranormal Roundtable has a website. It's PRTpodcast.com. Uh, that's the uh, website. And, and Josh Turner uh, at PRTpodcast.com. That's my email address. But you can also reach me on Facebook. Um, I don't do much of Twitter. I do a little bit, but mostly Facebook. And then I'm on Instagram as Josh Turner 940 And uh, we do have a mailing address, too. Um, and that is... Uh, something where you can you can use to send me things it's 6001 west palmer lane that's palmer p-a-r-m-e-r lane suite 370 pmb 131 austin texas 78727 so i've gotten some pretty cool stuff and and i we give do giveaways every episode and this episode is no exception we're going to do giveaway for this one but this one's special because this is the hernandez ranch and we've been talking about this and this is going to be a real meat and potatoes episode, I, I believe, because we got a lot to cover. Um, these episodes uh, encompass the story of some of, of a family and then their neighbor's family um, that live on a property, um, and they don't all live out there anymore. But they all lived on this property. They grew up on this property uh, in Central Texas, and a lot of weird things have happened on that property. So when I did these shows on DER. I was not really at liberty because of the way that, that, you know, that particular individual does his show. He wants to keep it as like, you know, flesh and blood as much as possible. That that was kind of the narrative at the time. Um, So we weren't able to tell like the whole story and, and, you know, so, but those stories have been told, okay, and they're there, but what we're doing now is picking up on the continuations of it. And so tonight we're going to talk about that. And so... We are at PRT, we are familiar with these people We on a personal level. Like, we worked with these people. And so, you know, I got to know these people a few years ago, and we hit it off. And for a couple of years, I worked with them, didn't even know that they had this kind of stuff going on. And then I found out, and I was like, oh, that's crazy. And then we just started, it just kind of, you know, developed a friendship. Uh, de- uh, uh, you know, not just a working uh, friendship, but friends, you know, outside of work. Because we had something in common, because I had an encounter, too, with these things. So, anyway, that being said, let me get, uh, before we get started talking about all this uh, uh, stuff, let me get to the uh, the information I got to give you. We have a Paranormal Roundtable group on Facebook. I have multiple groups, Paranormal Encounters, which is yours, Tony. Yep, I'm here. Tony Mooshu's with me tonight. The one and only. And uh, <laughs> the one and lonely. And then, and then we got... Uh, the Paranormal Lounge, which is Nelly's group, and then we have a bunch of other uh, groups, uh, Quad Coalition of Sciences, Dogman Werewolf Discussion. We have um, Paranormal Pod- uh, Trucker Podcast with John King. Um, there's so many. Quad Coalition of Sciences, Nick Valente, uh, Ryan Tremblay has Whisper to a Scream. Um, like, there's just a bunch of them, and we're affiliated with a whole lot of them. And a couple of the uh, North American Dogman Project uh, sites. And I'm friends with those guys too, and we do go back and forth, exchange information, and we're friends. So the, all that being said, hit me up on email. You can hit me up on Messenger. If you send me a Facebook friend request, I'm not going to approve it unless you tell me that you are a listener of the show, and then I will approve it. Otherwise, I'm not going to approve it. So you got to let me know that. The other thing I want to talk about is we have a Tuesday show a live stream that is a YouTube exclusive. You will not get it on any of these podcasts. It's only for YouTube, okay? So if it's your it's a YouTube exclusive and it comes on between 7:30 and 8 uh typically and it goes for anywhere between 2 and some I mean it can go as long as 4 hours, but it's typically 2 to 2 to 3 hours. Um and you get a lot of extra content. I mean, that's a lot of bonus content, folks. Go in there and listen. It's free. Um just go to YouTube and then you can be sure and like and subscribe and to my YouTube channel. And, uh, yeah, so that's what's going on. The, um, if you're just a podcast listener and that's all you listen to is, just the, you know, you're missing out. I'm telling you, cause YouTube is where I do the Tuesday show and you get a lot more uh, content, uh, to, to go along with my Friday episodes and we do a Q and a, there's a live chat and we usually get, you know, a few hundred people in there. And then by the time it, you know, 
the week drags on, it, it, we get several thousand views. And you can always go back and look at it in the archives on the YouTube. We put them, put it up there. If you missed the live, you can always go back and watch it later. So anyways, that being said, we're going to get into this. Uh, first thing I wanted to, 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 to welcome Tony back. He's been, on, uh, uh, you know, working a lot, so... Yeah, and I've <clears throat> happy to be back. You know, it's a uh, it's an exciting topic. You know, something I've been interested in. I was here for a couple of the first ones that we've done. I've met one of the few times I've actually met some of the uh, witnesses that you know when we go and actually we had dinner with him, uh, one of the gentlemen, and it was a wonderful time. So when I heard you were going to do this one again, I wanted to hop back on. I actually had a couple questions about it, so that's what you know was. I want to make sure I get those across before, you know, we finally uh, finish it off. Yeah. And last time we, I did the, sh I did the, I think it was uh, Hernandez Ranch. It was episodes 113 and 114, I believe. Um, Anthony and. Uh, yeah, it was me, Anthony and Nelly. Nelly think, and, yeah. and that was Rob, it, it, mostly Robbie's encounters. And before that, it was Return to Hernandez Ranch. We focused more on Joe, which was their uncle. He was the youngest of the uncles. Now, if you're not familiar with this, you got to go back and re-listen to those episodes. Uh, there were uncles uh, and, and their dad that all inherited this land, and it was like several hundred acres of land that was divided up into between these people. <clears throat> and one of them uh, was named Abel, and he found a dogman, child, puppy, whatever you want to call it, and it and it was he named it Stripes, the Legend the, of Stripes, the Legend of Stripes, because it had a grayish white stripe around its chest. Um, that over time became more like a, uh, uh, like on DER, he has a picture of it. And from what I was described, that looks nothing like it. That picture doesn't look, it looks goofy and cartoonish. And that's not really what it is. Um, that's not the picture that, that was given to, you know, what was told to me that this, as it got older, the stripe kind of just bled out into like a gray pattern on its chest. But it, it, apparently this thing did have descendants. And they did have that marking, and some of them didn't. Um, but uh, there were- It was like a birthmark. Kind of, yeah. yeah. It was like a, you know, and they said that there were many different types of these creatures on their property. Um, reddish brown ones, gray ones, black ones, and then black with the weird gray stripe across their chest um, or with the grayish, you know, hue on their chest. Um, and, and so Jerry, we're going to talk about Jerry. Jerry, what happened with Jerry was- he that's not the, that's not his real name, but but Jerry was a person that that worked with us at at our, one of our job sites, and in fact, it was one that you were working at, Tony, mm -hmm. down in South Austin, far far South Austin, and I, he heard me listening to the show uh, one day, and he started talking to me about it, and he started telling me that he had these stories of these creatures, and he he knew what they were, and so I was like, wow. So we started talking, and then we made plans to get together and talk, and of course, we did. No, correct me if I'm wrong. He's like the first one in, uh, out of that family to talk to you, right? Uh, about this, yeah. Yeah, okay. I, I met his his uncle and his brother before I ever met him. Mm -hmm. But me and him hit it off, and we. I you, you, were, you guys were the closest. Out yeah, of the family? Be, because where you were working at, he was showing up in the mornings every yeah. day to. Really, it was me. And yeah, you I remember working. him. Yeah, I I, I, I kind of talked to him a couple times. I think. Yeah. Well, of course. I mean, he worked there a long time yeah. for that company. But um, what happened was. Uh, he he got the rest of his family to come forward and talk to me, and over time, over about a year, I went and we were we all went out there one night too, but uh, we didn't actually go onto the property because we didn't go onto the property, but we drove up to it, and I said, "Well, there it is," and we left because I did not want to go on that property. There was a lot of activity at that time, and I was just not up for that at the time. I am now, <clears throat> but I wasn't at the time. I just wasn't wasn't ready. Um, and, and so I, I got to meet his uncles and one of them is Noah, which we're going to talk about tonight. And then he has, um, uh, his other uncle, Abel and Adam. Now Adam passed away, um, you know, while we were getting these stories and then Abel gave me his story about stripes and all that. And unfortunately someone from that other show had tried to push me to, to get Abel to go on that show and uh, he kind of lost trust with me, unfortunately, and then he passed away. But then Jerry and me continued to talk, and he didn't hold it against me. He knew that I was being pressured, um, and so I just kind of like let it let it go. You know, I was like, well, you know, this it is what it is. <clears throat> me and Jerry stayed friends, and and we continued to correspond. And he has a lot of stuff to talk about. Like initially, he didn't have a whole lot of encounters or a whole lot that went on with him out there on the ranch. Now, 
in, in the last installment of this, you know, series, we talked about how Robbie had left and moved and he ended up moving two or three times. And then he's living in South San Antonio, uh, cause th- their company has expanded and, you know, to go further South and working at, a, at a, for another, uh, large home builder. And so what, what he experienced, you know, everybody had their own experiences and Jerry stayed on the ranch. His, his deal is he, he basically said, you know, I'm going to stay here. They even, uh, started working on a project to build a, another uh, barn and a bunch of other stuff, and, and he's committed to staying there. Um, at one time, though, his wife had gotten so frustrated with the situation that she had stayed in town at her sister's house. And so then he got her, hey, you know, I'm building this, I'm remodeling the house and everything, you know, and eventually she came back. But a, a, a lot of weird things happen. And and so we'll get into that, you know, pretty quickly here. Um so one of the things that uh, that Jerry told me that this was going on concurrent with what was happening with Joe, what was happening with his brother Andre, who was the oldest brother, and and uh, what they called Junior. He's when they called Junior, and then what was happening with uh, Robbie. This was all happening at the same time. They it wasn't like one it happened to one person, then another person. No, it kept going. It's just. So Jerry's daughter had said, hey, look, there's a bunny. That's how it started with him when he, the first one he saw. And, uh, he's like, dude, it's almost Christmas time. This isn't, you know, this is no bunny. There's no bunnies out there. It's, it's winter, you know? And, uh, he looks outside and he sees this thing with really tall ears. And he described it to me. And I said, dude, it's almost like a lifelike Wile E. Coyote. And he said, yeah, but there's nothing cartoonish about it, you know? And, and so you know, his daughter had seen that and she was little and, and he had a son too. And they had a, the, the, some weird things that happened. One of their dogs had, had gone missing. And, and so he had a few things that happened, but it was more happening to his brother and his uncles. And he ma- made it clear to me that, that they had had a lot more experiences. Well, once everybody began to move away from the, the land, it seemed like he was kind of there. So he kind of became a focal point of whatever was there. And, and I honestly don't know exactly. Uh, it's so hard to even begin. Where do I begin? I'll start with this. When his daughter was about eight or nine years old, uh, she had her cousin over, which was uh, Joe's, one of Joe's uh, kids. And I guess that would be, it would have been his, um, literally his first cousin. But she was about the same age as his daughter, so it would have been his daughter's second cousin. So they had her over, and they had one of, uh, I think, Robbie's stepdaughter and Andre, and then they had a couple friends, and it was like a slumber party for for the kids. And uh, they, they were playing with a Ouija board, mm-hmm. and one of them had brought the Ouija board over. Always I think a it was foolish mistake. Always Every a, time I hear that, it's like, what what is wrong with you? <laughs> it, it happens, man. I mean, and so Robbie's, I think it was Robbie's stepdaughter, and they had done this at Robbie's house, too. So the the stepdaughter's like of Robbie. She's like, "Hey, let's play with this Ouija board." And this was before all this uh, wackiness had had ensued over at their house. Um, and I think that what happened here actually prompted them going and playing with it over there because she wanted to show her little friends, "Hey, this is real." But and 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 so what happened was, and I think the reason that it didn't affect Robbie's daughter so much as it did uh, everybody else is because get this, they're playing with the Ouija board. And then she goes to the bathroom down the hall, and while she's in the bathroom, this thing uh, it shows up like it pops up, and it and it's like this smoky. They now his daughter described it as a smoky gray, swirling cloud. Okay, and it it, it just kind of came up, and it was like hovering, and it and it was like there was no lower body; there was just like a ch- kind of a chest, just upper body, yeah, and weird looking skinny things that she thought were like arms, but there was a pronounced wolf like head, and it was moving around, and it began to snap and and like bite, and it was slowly taking form, and they all just ran in terror in every direction, and one kid ran into a lamp and hit her head. And of course, slumber party's over. Everybody's going home and freaking out and whatever. What a good time to go to the bathroom. Right? <laughs> yeah. So when the uh, little girl who we'll call her Jessica, we'll be probably, probably going to reference her again later. Uh, that would have been Robbie's daughter, stepdaughter. When she came back, Jessica and and Jerry's daughter, we'll call her Melissa. Uh, they were the only ones that ended up staying. 
Um, and she said, I'm going to try, I'm going to, I'm going to try to summon this thing. And they tried it again over at her house and it went, some weird stuff happened again, you know? Well, th- that, that was kind of the beginning. Like Jerry thinks that it had a lot to do with that because before that there wasn't anything in his house. He wasn't dealing with like hauntings or anything weird like that, but he thinks that that may have opened up a portal or a gateway. And then the activity spiked from there. He said a lot of the activity wasn't really on his end of the property. It was more toward uh, uh, Shane's area of the property and his brother. And those are the guys that – that's not their real names, but those are those are their uh, – so anyway, Shane, Shane, his brother's property, was on the other side of Noah's property, and that was more uh, toward the west was where a lot of this stuff was going on. And so he thought – he felt like, you know, there wasn't a whole lot happening in his area – there weren't. It wasn't as heavily wooded as it was over there on that side. Um, there was a pasture, and then kind of like a, a clearing, and then there's a bunch of trees, and that's where the woods began on the other side of his property. And it was kind of a hollow down there, but he didn't really mess around down there too much because he didn't like, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on, and he had a lot of wild hogs out there, and they were really bad. And so one of the things that that uh, he talked about to me was he felt uneasy a couple nights after the the Ouija board thing. He heard like a loud boom, 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 like walking through the hallway. So he gets up and uh, decides to go and investigate because it woke him up. And, of course, his wife, she's not even waking up. She's not even aware that something's going on. And he's like, how can she not be aware? He tried shaking her awake and tried to tell her, hey, you know, there's this loud thudding whatever going on down the hallway. And she didn't even respond. Like it was like, she was like, you know, dead to the world. And he's like, man, is she breathing? You know? And he, she's like, you know, and so he heard her little snore a little bit and he's like, okay. And so he's like, well, it, it was weird. She's usually a light sleeper. So he went down the hallway. He didn't see anything. Well, he checked on the kids and didn't, they, you know, they were sound asleep. And so he went around the house looking, um, didn't find anything. Even his little bitty kid, the youngest one, didn't the sound asleep, nothing going on. Um, and so he wanders uh, around the house, you know, looking, turning on lights, and he sees this thing standing in, uh, in between the refrigerator and the counter, and it's it's looking out the back. His back door has like a window on it, and it's standing there, and it's looking out like it's bent down. He sees it from behind, and it's looking out the window, and he's like, what the heck is that? And he goes, like, I, he goes, I, I started to back up. He said it was just like a gray uh, werewolf-looking creature. Was it similar uh, similar to the one that they summoned to, through the Ouija board? He, he, well, hold on. Here, I'll tell you about it. Okay. So anyway, he's sitting there watching it, and he said that you could you could almost see like it was vibrating, like you know, pulsating. You know, um, he didn't say vibrating; it's my words. But he said that it was like like it was pulsating or something like it was moving, like like it was blurred. And he thought, well, what is this this thing that I'm seeing here? You know. And he knew that it had to be one of those creatures, but he was like, why is it in my house? And and How did it get here? How did it get in there? And what's it doing? Why is it looking out the window? And why did my family not hear it? And I'm the only one hearing it. Then he just gets really drowsy, like he's about to fall out. And he goes, dude, I started getting dizzy. My head started spinning. He said, next thing you know, I wake up, I'm in my bed. And it was like, what the heck? Was that a dream? Was that real? What the heck? Am I losing my freaking mind here? What's going on? So then he gets up and starts his day. Um, and as he is going uh, out to his truck, he hears like a loud guttural growl, which he thought was coming from the other side of his truck. And he says broad daylight and he's got his coffee in his hand and he's like, what is that? So he goes around the other side and he thinks he sees like a tail, like or something go behind his truck on the other side. He goes, so I go around the other side of my truck, and I'm like, what is this? And then I, I walked all the way around it twice. I didn't see anything. He's like, I think it was like something was playing with me. He's like, well, I know I saw like a dog's like tail, and I, I heard it. I heard the noise. So he just he, he, he shakes it off, and he gets in his truck, and he goes to work. And uh, so, you know, all day long, though, he couldn't uh, stop thinking about the weird thing that happened to him at, you know, four in the morning with that with that creature. And uh, he said it was like 3.34 in the morning and uh, dead of night, you know. And then for some reason, he don't remember going and laying back down, but he must have because he woke up in his bed. So he said that that the night that his mother died, now this was really a tragic thing that happened. 
And I talked about it a little bit on the last show when Robbie had to go back and get the medication and then his mother ultimately ended up passing away in the hospital. She had a heart attack. Um, he had a dream, and I don't know if this has any, anything to do with it, but he had a dream that his mother had died. And his mother, after she passed away, came to him in a, in, in a dream, which he, he felt like was very vivid and very real. And she was telling him, beware wolves, beware wolves. That she kept saying that in the dream. And he... I wonder what that can mean. You know? Yeah, well, and, and he could not ascertain. He kept telling me, he goes, I don't know if it was me. Um, this was his words. He said, I don't know if it was me like having dream because you dream about stuff, you know, that you got to deal with in your life. Yeah. And he said, I don't know if I was dreaming about this and it just came to me in a dream, you know, and it was like, or if it was really her and she was trying to warn me. And he goes, and so I had all these uh, more questions and answers, you know, and, and so I kept thinking, is she... Is, is my mother's spirit telling me about these wolf-like creatures or or is it just my mind, you know, going, is it just, you know, doing whatever, doing what it does in the dream? And he asked me about that and I told him if I had to put money on it, I'd say there was a, a, a warning. I'd say that she was trying to tell you um, yeah, because something well, happened. I feel like it was a warning from either both his subconscious or his mother, like no matter which one it was, it was a warning that should be taken, you know, should have yeah. been taken lightly. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, deep enough to where it needs to tell you. No matter who it was. Yeah, ab absolutely. And I know from experience that when people pass over, you do have, you know, you dream. I I've I've done it many, many times. When people pass over, I'll dream about them. Um, you know, most recently my mother, you know, uh, uh, you know, when she passed over. Willie. But, I mean, and then Willie, yeah, I had the the weird thing about with Willie. That was weird. But, uh, you know, he's a friend of mine that passed over, uh, crossed over in 2020. Rest in peace. Yeah, rest in peace, Willie. And my mother, and, and they both died in May, yeah. almost around the same time, one one year, and then the next year my mother died. And uh, so there, there's a lot of weird stuff uh, to this. Now, the night that his mother died, when he got the call to go to the hospital, he this is this is really crazy. Like he was walking outside, and this was probably a few weeks. I think he said after the Ouija board thing had happened, whatever. Um, and, and there were already some, some weird things that were happening. He was having this recurring dream where he was walking outside and this wolf thing was, would come running up at him. He'd run back inside. And so he, he walks outside to go to his vehicle. His, his mother, I mean, his, his, his mother's in the hospital. His wife had gotten the call. He was working late. He came home. Um, <clears throat> and he got in the call right when he was walking up to go inside and then he grabs a, a, a snack or whatever, and then runs right back out. And he's like eating cause he hadn't eaten all day. And he's starting to feel kind of, you know, peaked, whatever. And he gets outside and he he tried to explain it that that was what it was too. He said, maybe I was just, you know, he's a very pragmatic guy, as you know. And he was trying to explain it to himself, like maybe that's why this was happening. <clears throat> but he looks up in this tree, he sees it shaking. You know, there's this big tree in his yard and he sees it shaking and he's like, what is that? And he sees this werewolf, I mean, just not like werewolf-like. He said it was like werewolf creature. Mm -hmm. Like something out of the, the way that he describes it, like the howling. They always talk about these. They, they say it looked like these things from the howling or something like a, you know. And he said that it, it, it was up in the tree and it was black, but he could see it. And he could see it like its eyes were almost white, glowing white. And he could see it blinking its its eyes. And he said that it was like, and he heard like as, as he was walking to his vehicle, he stared at it for a second. And then he thought, I, I got a task at hand that I got to deal with. I can't be distracted by this. And he did feel like it was an evil, demonic type thing. Um, that's the impression, the feeling that he got from it. And he said he heard a laugh, like a laughter coming from, and it sounded very much like a man's laugh. And he said that he looked up, he didn't see this thing's mouth move, but it was like in his head. And he said that he almost thought that there was like a man or something there by the tree with this thing, because it sounds so much like a human. And he thought, no way that thing could be making that noise. But it scared the heck out of him. But he's going; all these emotions are going on. His mother's, you know, dying, and so he has to get in the, in, in the truck and just go. He doesn't have time to sit there and ponder, you know, like what this is or why it's there. And he said it didn't go away. Like he looked up and it was still there. Like it was very watching much there, him watching him. Out. Yeah. Wow. And the whole time he was driving out, and he thought, "Man, I'll deal with that later. I don't have time for this right now." And he was worried about his dogs because his dogs were missing, and so. One by one, his dogs were disappearing, and and so he he had you know he's driving, and all these things are going on. He gets to the hospital, 
his mom's there for a couple of days and she hangs on and then she, she passes. And then he was in the uh, waiting area, you know, and, uh, he fell asleep. And when he fell asleep, he woke up with a start and startled everybody around him because he jumped up, you know, and he, he immediately re- remembers this dream. Like he had gone into his mom's room and his brothers, the two of his brothers were in there and they were holding her, either one of her, her hands and he walked in and when he walked in, this wolf-like creature was standing behind the door. And when he went to look at it, it put its finger up to its mouth like, shh, you know? And so he just like goes, ah, and he jumps back. And then he wakes up and he's in the waiting room. So then he goes down to, to where his mom is at. And 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 there, just like he thought, there was a brother on either side that were holding his mother's hand. And then he, because he was tired, he had fallen asleep. And so they had to kind of switch out because they could only have so many people, you know. And so he he went to sit down with his mother, and he she checked behind the door first. I would have. Yeah, well, I didn't ask about that, but um, so so anyway, he said that he said that that this thing was happening quite a bit. There's these weird dreams, <clears throat> and he really felt like he had been targeted after you know, like it was following him because like I could understand it if it was he was still on the land having those you know dreams because it was the same area that he had the uh, that his daughters had the Ouija board or mm-hmm. and his daughters and his stepneys. But, you know, now that he's in the hospital, absolutely, like, far away from the house, the fact that he's still, like, having these reoccurring dreams is, you know, a little terrifying. Oh, yeah. And uh, the, the whole dream thing in itself scares me because it's, like, the the fact that, you know, that he's wandering around and no one else can wake up and mm-hmm. no one else is, like, rousing is, like, scares me because it's, like, you know, the, he's absolutely alone in a place where you would think he'd be safe. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and and one of the things that that uh, stuck with me too was how he said that because I had dreams, you know, and I told him that I said I had dreams for a long time after my encounter, um, but my encounter I think was a little more terrifying as opposed to what his because you were a little kid, yeah, I was so a little, I was fifteen, and he didn't really wasn't really bothered by his initial encounters, but but um, he just knew about his brothers and uncles' encounters, whatever. But this was, you know, he said, he said, I felt like it was my turn, you know, but while all this was going on, Joe was having all kinds of problems as his uncle, you know, and then Noah was dealing with all kinds of stuff. Andre was dealing with all kinds of stuff. And then Robbie was dealing with all kinds of stuff. And then, so like a curse, it was all going on. Yeah. And it was, and then Shane and his brother were dealing with it. Now Shane's brother and Noah deal with these things in a much different way. They don't really have a fear. It's more of an anger and they look at them as a nuisance and as a pest and they, they basically are at war with them, you know. Um, everybody else is just like, dude, let's leave these things alone and hope they go away. Let's pray. Let's do this. Let's do that, you know. Well, um, so everybody's able. He's the one like, oh, I'll just adopt them. Yeah. Well, and, and 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 we'll talk about that. That's a different type of deal, though. I think what happened with him was very unique that can't really be duplicated. Yeah. Um. And, and now <clears throat> there's some really weird stuff here. I'm going to get into some weird stuff here, okay? <clears throat> this is what happened. Right after his mother had passed away, he ended up uh, going to uh, going to work one one night. Um, he had to go he had to go up there to help uh, Joe finish up on a project. His uncle, and he it was it was dark already, and he told his wife, "He said I'm going to go up there. I'm going to work until you know till dawn. Try to get this done." And so he goes out there to his truck, and get this: he gets into the truck, and as he's starting to close the door, he closes. He's trying to close the door, and something is impeding the door from being closed. This was probably one of the most terrifying things, like right here. I mean, this one freaked me out because I've heard of these kind of things happening, and it was like when he was telling me this, dude, I could tell he was just completely – he looks down, and he sees this black mass because it's dark, you know, and he's like me. Actually, we have something in common, me and him. We we don't we we turn off that that the cargo the overhead light. Mm-hmm. So when you open the door, it doesn't come on because yes. I don't want everybody seeing me. And so he he didn't have it on, and he's looking down. And he goes, "I can't see it." So he goes, "I click on the 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 light, and I see that it's like an a hairy looking arm." Oh. And he's like, "It's reaching for my leg," and I felt it move hit my leg a couple times. And at one point, I thought maybe it was a spider or something. I looked down. And he goes, and I move my leg, and then I I feel the truck go boom, boom, like it goes up and down. Now this is a freaking bit a Ford F one fit a Ford F two fifty, you know, like a like a a big truck, you know what I mean, like yeah. a diesel that just bounced up and a down. A work truck, basically. a work truck, yeah. It's not, you know. And he's like, what the heck? 
And so then he starts to try to close the door again, and this thing is pushing its arm out literally to to keep the door open. Where's the hand coming from? Yeah, it's from underneath the truck. He's high. Oh my gosh! And so he's and so yeah. So he he said, "Dude, I didn't know what to do." So I started kicking at it, and then it reached in and it grabbed my pant leg and started pulling on me, and I'm screaming at the top of my lungs, and I'm honking the horn and everything. And he goes, "And I have a firearm." that's under the seat and I'm trying to reach under there to grab this thing. And he goes, I don't know what I'm going to do. And he said, eventually he goes, I kicked it loose and I managed to close the door. And then the truck bounced up again. He goes, and all I see is this black mass go out in the right side and go toward my yard. And then he, and it just looked like it was a flat black mass. And he said that there looked like there was a, a head on, on the, at the end of it. He said that's what it looked like, but he couldn't tell for sure, and that the head looked like it turned around like 180 degrees and went forward, and this thing was like flattened out, and it crawled away like a like like a like a spider or a bug. Did say that the, that the head looked canid, and he goes, "Dude, I'm like, what in the heck?" And you know, they said I call my wife, and she's like in there watching TV, and he says, "Dude, I've been out here screaming, honking the horn," and she's like, "I didn't hear anything," and he's like, "There's no way you couldn't have heard all," you know. And so at this point he gets his pistol out and then he's terrified to leave his family there. He can't, you know, so he calls Joe and says, I'm not going to leave. So he, you know, he goes out and, and walks around the property terrified because he, you know, what is he going to do? He's out there with his family yeah. and uh, his son comes out and he wants to go with him. And he says, no, I'm not going to, no, don't do that. You know? And so he grabs his shotgun, he goes around and his pistol and he patrols, he patrols you know. and he's like, oh, I don't, my gosh, I don't know what this thing was. You know, he he knew what it was, but he didn't, he, you know, he had never seen anything like that before, you know? And so he was terrified. I mean, it was an absolute uh, horrific incident. Um, but you, Tony, have, have been part of PRT for as long as you have. We've gotten stories like this before. Yeah. These things running out of people's vehicles. People- well, I mean, I have a routine when I get into a car is I always check my back seat. So that is just because it's like you never know what's going to be back there. <laughs> yeah, like you just, just why why take the risk? So now it's nice to know that I also have to go to check under my car because apparently, you know, they like to just hide under there, and mm-hmm. it's really scary to think about because you know it's like it, it being black and like him not being able to see it until mm-hmm. very last moment. Oh man! And then and then he he tells me, you know, I said what what color were these things? And he said the the, the main one that he kept seeing over and over again was just black. Pure black, pure black, and and it, but he said the one, and he thinks it's the same one that was looking out the window when it. He said when it appeared gray, like with with its like kind of a, of a shimmering, you know, whatever, kind of blurry. He said that he thinks that it was like a spiritual type thing. You know what I mean? Like that's what it was, and you you know it was it was in like a spirit form. But he said that it was very much a physical form. You know that he thought when it was up in the tree mocking him that night. Oh, um, does he think they're the same creature? Oh, yeah. That's okay. what he definitely thinks okay. is one creature in particular. And he even went so far. Now, I told him, I said, you know, when we talked about stripes. And I said, dude, you know, you remember stripes had the 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 markings on his chest. It was like light, gray, white, whatever. And he said, dude, it wasn't that. He said, you know, Abel was very adamant that stripes and, and any of those that had those markings would not hurt us. And he said, but there was another type out there, the, the reddish brown ones. And then there was this gray ones. And he said, then there were these solid black ones. And he said the solid black ones were the biggest ones and that they were maybe related to stripes, you know, but not, they weren't like them. They were not, there was no Observe, connection yeah, there. Absolutely. No, there was nothing, nothing but pure evil coming off of them. And his daughter, his daughter said that when she was coming home from uh, softball practice one time, she got dropped off by a friend and her friend's like, what is that? And they see this thing sitting on the other side of the, one of the barbed wire fences as they're getting onto the property. And there's like a long drive uh, going on the gravel road. And they're like, what is that? And they see it kind of start to run alongside the, the barbed wire fence. And, of course, they're going to have to turn right into the driveway. And this thing is running along the barbed wire fence about to meet them. Yeah. And the girl's mother starts freaking out, dude. She's like, oh, my gosh. What the heck is that? And she's like in a minivan and she's with three girls, you know, like kids, a 12, 13 year old, whatever kids. Um, I, I guess they were 14 or 13 or 14, something like that. Um, and she said, you know, he said, dude, this was crazy. It was like, you know, uh, this, this, uh, she was coming in the minivan, whatever, driving. And he said that it was just an, a, a horror, horrific experience. Like the, they all started screaming 
And this thing came right up to the fence, and then it kind of stood up, and leaning on like the 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 gate that was open, and it was like a metal uh, cattle gate, whatever. And it was leaning on it, and then it just shoved it to like close. And the the minivan when it pulled in ended up like hitting it, and then this thing like started to run around, literally like run like in a circle and go back around to the front of the of the uh, vehicle. And then stood up again, and they all were just staring at it in, in absolute terror. So the mom pulls out and then drives, like, all the way into town. And then they go to, like, a Dairy Queen, and she calls and says, Hey, I'm not going to drop your daughter off. And, the, and then nobody was even home at that time, so she would have dropped her off by herself. And the daughter was just in, in, in hysterics. Yeah. And mm. so that was the one encounter that the daughter had. And then there was another time where she was outside and she had one of those pitch backs where you throw the ball and it bounce, whatever. And she's out there practicing with it, whatever. And uh, she she hears like footfall coming from the wood, the tree line. And then she turns and looks and she sees this one black creature and then this reddish brown one that was a little bit smaller come out behind it. And she said they just looked like quintessential werewolves. They just looked like wolf-like uh, humanoids, yeah. humanoidal wolves, you know. And so she said her dog, she had a little beagle. His name was Spirit. Um, it's funny. And so Spirit gets really freaked out and starts growling. And then as these things got down on all fours and started running toward her, so they're still like two or 300 yards away. But she says, they're coming towards me. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. So she grabbed her stuff and the dog and picked him up because he was all you know animated. And she took off running and went into the house. And she said it was an uh, uh, early summer. And there was nobody at home but her and her youngest brother. And so she called her mom and her dad, said, there's these two things out here. They're coming toward the house. And she said that she she went and she hid down in between the, her bed and the wall. And she said that the, she was like, unfortunately, there was just a little bit uh, where the blinds come down, you know, it was open a little bit. Mm -hmm. And she says, when you know, She's laying there, and right there she sees something peeking in, looking in. She can see movement, and she hears like what she thought sounded like two guys having a conversation in a language she couldn't understand. And she was like, what the heck is that? And then she she heard something bump against the house. And this is broad daylight. She said it was like, you know, 7, 8 o'clock, and it wasn't dark yet. It was, you know, you know, it gets dark late in the summertime here. And so she was like laying there and she was just like, she started crying and she was freaking out. She grabbed her Bible and her, and her uh, rosary and she was laying there and the dog didn't make any noise. Thank goodness. She's like, I just laid there and I was like, please don't make noise. Please don't make noise. And she said, whenever this happened, there was a couple other dogs that kind of hung out near the barn because he has kind of like a barn, kind of like a, uh, uh, what do you call that? Like a, oh gosh, what do you call those big, uh, open things? Um. I don't even know what they're called. Uh, kind of like my uncle Butch has. Uh, they're like a carport, but they're but they're a hanger. Oh, okay. It's like a giant hanger yeah. looking thing. Um, and she says it's like it's like it's like a barn right next to that. And then, but the dogs kind of hang hung out in that area. And whenever these things were around the house, the dogs would going be seen. They would run off. Yeah. And they were scared. And so she's like, man, what is, what is the point of having these mean dogs if they're scared of these things, you know? And so she laid there just in terror. And then finally, her mom comes home. Um, and her mom came home with her brother, with her uncle, what would have been her uncle, Jerry's brother-in-law. And they come home and, and they go inside and, and they're like, are you okay? Are you okay? And Melissa's like, yeah, I'm fine. She's just shaking and terrified. So then that's when Jerry's wife said, okay, enough's enough. And she took the kids uh, to go live with her, her sister in town. Um, but her son, the older, the oldest son said, no, I want to live out there with dad. I don't want to, I don't want to leave. He liked being out there and he didn't really have a lot of stuff happening that he had, he hadn't seen a whole lot at that point. So he was just kind of like, well, it's not really happening to me type attitude, you know? Yeah. Ignorance of the young. Yeah. So, so one day <laughs> he goes with his uncle Andre, who's Jerry's oldest brother. And he goes, uh, with, with, uh, Joe and Noah and they all go out hunting and it's Joe, which is his, Noah's younger brother, which is Jerry's uncle. And of course, Joe is the youngest of those of those uncles, and he's closer in age to them than he was. Kind of like, like he said, he was a mistake, you know. And, and his mother had him when she late was accident, late accident, yeah. yeah. 
And so she was like, you know, he's like 10, 12 years younger than the next, you know, oldest brother. And so he was closer in age to them, you know. So he's about 10, 10, 12 years older than them, you know. And so anyway, he ended up, they all went out hunting and they had, he had his uh, stepson with them and they all went out. And uh, there was like five or six of them. And they all spread out in two man groups. There were, th- I think there were six people. So they spread out in two man groups. So it was him and his uncle. Uh, he liked his uncle Andre a lot. So Andre uh, was set up with him. And uh, they end up uh, seeing this thing come out of the clearing. And it was deer season. They were hunting deer. But, you know, if there's a hog, yeah. hog season all year long. Yeah. Hog Texas. season don't stop. Yeah. Hog season don't stop. So you just, you know, so they're out there and, and they're, you know, setting up whatever, and then they they're there for another hour or so, and the conversation turned to ghosts. Like it was weird because they said their land is haunted, and they've seen one one thing in particular. They've seen a lot of is Native American ghosts. They see spirits that look like Native Americans, and they'll disappear. And there could be a connection there mm-hmm. between that and what we're talking about here, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, but. What's really weird is like they're sitting there talking about it, and he goes, and then all of a sudden he goes, I look out into the clearing. This is what his son was saying, and he thinks he sees a, a Native American, like an, an Indian, and he's like, dude, am I seeing that? And so he nudges his Uncle Andre, who was pouring some coffee from his thermos, and he looked up, and they looked through the binoculars, and they did. And then this thing, this uh, guy, I don't want to say thing or guy, I don't know what it was, laid down on the ground, and they were like, the heck was that? Like, wh- who is that? What is it doing? And he goes, is that a Native American guy or something? Because we, we were just talking about it, you know. And then one pops up, shows up, you know, that looks very Native. Um, and he was like, dude, I, 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 it was, I thought maybe my eyes were playing tricks on me because it's, we're talking about it, you know. And so, and this, this story was relayed to me actually by Andre. And uh, so what happens is they're sitting there and there's they, they they the guy disappears they in behind and there's there's like some grass and you know, they can't see over him. And so they're waiting for him to reappear well he never does. And so they're like, "Huh. Well, that's weird." And so they kind of debated about going out there to see who if there was somebody if something was wrong with this guy or why was find he out, yeah, like trying to find he out. Yeah, off somewhere. And just about that time this buck comes up, you know, and just they're, they're talking, they're looking at each other. And when they're, while they're sitting there looking at each other and contemplating, this buck just, they just see, they look and they see a buck running straight toward them. And he's like, oh man. So they both, you know, get cocked and loaded, ready to, to, to shoot, you know? And uh, he said that this thing started b- bouncing all over the place, like weird, like, like it is zigzag, like, like you weren't going to be able to sh- get a shot at it. You know what I mean? And he said it was moving so fast. And then all of a sudden it just runs into the woods out of that clearing. And they're like, oh man, what the heck was that? And I asked him at that point, I told Andre, I said, dude, did, did this buck, did it come up from where that guy was laying? He goes, I don't know, because we were like looking at each other, and then we looked back, and it was a buck. And I said, dude, because that's very much <clears throat> skinwalker-ish behavior, yeah. you know? And then, and I don't know if it's connected or what, but then from the other side of the clearing, from like, from this, that was, it went, it went off into the right side, into Andre and, and his right side. And then they look over to the left side, and this reddish brown creature comes waddling out that they, at first they thought was a bear. And then they see that it had a very triangular head. It looked like a wolf. And he was like, dude, what the heck is that? That That's not a bear. That looks like a wolf. And so then they started talking about it and they looked through the, 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 the scopes, you know, and, and whatever. And they were like, that's, that is one of these wolf creatures, you know, next thing you know, it's standing up on his hind legs and starting to sniff around and, so Jerry's son gets nervy and shoots at it. This thing doesn't like go run, go like get scared and run away. It just kind of walks and then gets back on all fours and goes back into the woods. Like and then, annoyed. Like it was, yeah, like he didn't care. Like it was yeah. indifferent. You know, he said it was so indifferent about the, the gunshot. And he said that, you know, about 30 minutes later, they hear boom on the side of this little shed that they're on. And then they, they, there's the like a tin roof on the top of it. The roof begins to roll backward, like like somebody was peeling a can. And then they look up and they see, you know, this, and this is in daylight. This isn't nighttime. 
And this thing, the, the, the roof began to peel backwards in one corner and it just started to roll back and roll back. And they're like, what the heck is that? You know, like what is going on here? And, you know, he, his, Jerry's son was, he had remorse. He's like, I wish I never would have shot at that thing, you know? And so he was sitting there and they were like, what in the heck is going on? And right then he says, he turns and he looks and right there in front of them was that native looking guy that he had seen, that he had seen lay down. And for a split second, it was there and then it was gone. And then he turns and this, the, the roof and all that, everything stopped. And then uh, about 30 minutes later, they're like, hey, you know, another half an hour goes by. They're just sitting there stunned and they, they see part of the roof peeled, peeled off. And he's like, look, we need to get out of here. We're going to have to get out and try to make it to the ATV and get and let's get out of here. And so, his, his, so Uncle Andre says, you know, let's do this. And so they they go out the, the, the side, you know, and they and they go to the, the vehicles. And, and as they're getting ready to start them up, this thing comes charging out at them as they're driving away. And then this thing was keeping pace with them. And they were hauling. He said these these ATVs they had, they were pretty uh, powerful. Um the, the one he had with the roll bar and all that, it's kind of like the one that my, my uncle has, you know, over there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. that one has, so you can gain some good speed. It's got a lot of good speed, good yeah. power. It's very big. Well, uh, real quick question. Did they ever see which one, like what was rolling back the... They didn't see it. It just looked like it was okay. like an invisible thing was doing it. Okay. And so when they, when they turned, he turned around and he looked behind him and there is this reddish brown creature, you know, with a slimmer build than a, than a bear. But about the size of a, of a small grizzly bear, according to what they they said they saw, and it was just chasing behind them, following them on the trail. But they eventually outpaced it, and it stopped, and then got up on all fours and let out a weird growl that Andre said he could feel it go through his back and out of his chest. Now we've heard of this before, infrasound. And I told Andre, I said that's infra infrasound. Um, you know. Um, so I should I should also emphasize that that I have never I have never spoken to Andre in person. I have only spoken to him on, on, the, phone, on the phone. On the phone. Yeah, and it was only that one the one time, and he gave me a couple of of encounters, and then the other encounters I got from him all came from Jerry. Now I've never spoken to to Andre in person. I've met all the other people in person except for him. Uh, never met uh, Abel in person. I was gonna do this just about ask. Yeah, what about and, Noah? Yeah, Noah either. But I, all of the brothers and Joe, I've met them all in person, and I've met a few of their children and stuff like that. Never, never uh, met this guy. Never talked to him face to face. So um, Andre was like, just you know, he he just was. He talks very. He's very. Um, how to describe him? He's a. Uh, He's one of those people, he talks very, just very calmly. He's like this. He doesn't get rattled or excited. He just talks like he's very. He's just telling you the points. Yeah. And and, and he's, Jerry always teases him. He says he's like, he's always on Ambien or something. <laughs> I was like, but he's just very calm, you know, and he's very calm. He's the antithesis to, to Noah, who's just very, you know, erratic and hyperactive and ADHD, quite the character, quite the character you know. Um, yeah. And, and so whenever he was telling me this, he was just like, you know, he, he began to be the trip over his words a little bit because he was talking faster and you could tell he was reliving it, um, just to relay to everybody, you know? So whenever he was telling me, I was just like, dude, this is, you know, this is horrible. You know, it's a horrible experience, but it was so bizarre. And I asked him about it. Did you have any dreams or anything happen? He said, no, but Jerry told me that his son did for like couple months he was having dreams of this creature and it was the this reddish brown creature and his son was very adamant that it was flesh and blood that it looked like flesh and blood that it chased them um you did know his I, son never see like have dreams as a native american no i i did ask that and no they didn't um did any of them like ever see that native american again that specific uh, one? Andre didn't either. No, mm. no and and not that not that specific one but yeah they did see yeah, others i assume they've seen others yeah. but yeah, and then there was another incident where the son again, Jerry's son was with the the daughter and the daughter had a boyfriend that was a couple years older. They were in high school. Um like she she I think he was like 16, she was 14 or 15, something like that. Anyway, she was he was a little bit older and he had a license and he was giving them a ride home. And he lived on a property not too far away and they had been over there hanging out at his place and he had like a trampoline and they were playing on it whatever. And so this 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 young man was driving them home, and they see this 
right in front of their vehicle, in front of his Jeep, this uh, half of a deer carcass comes flying out from the tree line and lands right in front of his vehicle. And he, he swerves and they almost wrecked. And good, luckily there was nobody else on the road, you know, with them. And then when they look to the right, they see this thing just kind of hunched down with its arms. It had arms, they said, and it was down, squatted down, and the arms were just hanging off of the leg, over the legs. And it was just like staring at him, and it was almost like it was smirking. And it was a reddish-brown creature, and he and, and Jerry's son was adamant that was the same one that him and Andre had seen. And uh, that happened like, a, a you know, shortly after that incident, you know. And he was like, dude, it was just like... We're driving along and this thing comes flying out in front of us and we're just like, holy crap, it's a half of a deer, you know? And he looks and he's like, his his sister was already in hysterics because of what had happened, you know, to her prior, like a, it was like a year or two before that, you know, with the with the uh, nightmarish creature. So she was like, oh, again. I had here to we deal go with again, this. yeah. And then the, then the thing that this was after what had happened when it came when she was playing with the pitch bag. So- she, you know, just sitting there, all, all these things are happening. And then one day they're, they're, they had a couple of cousins over. They had like a, a, a it was a quinceanera, if anybody knows what that is. And it was his Celebration uh, cousins, of the 15th. Yeah, the 15th birthday of the of the, of the females in, in Mexican culture. And so the, the at, after the quinceanera, his uh, cousins, quinceanera, they all got together and they came out to the ranch. And, and Jerry was out there barbecuing and cooking, whatever. Um, they had like a formal, like the formal dance, or whatever that, the whatever, and then and then they all went there for like kind of an after whatever. And so they they were they were they were eating and doing all this stuff, and right before like everybody's eyes, um, this wolf like creature comes out. One of the cousins had brought their dog. That was like they said. I think it was like a little schnauzer or something, and it kept barking at the tree line. And in front of like dozens of of onlookers, this wolf-like creature was on all fours. It didn't look werewolf-like. He told me it was like wolf-like. It just comes out of the tree line and snatches that dog and then runs back into the woods. So everybody tries to like get up in arms and go running into the woods after it. And Jerry and his brothers are all like, don't do that. Don't do that. You know, and they're like, why? They just took, you know, his cousin was like all aggravated. You know, his cousin, uh, Luis, was like, well, that just snatched my dog, my daughter's dog or whatever, um, or his girlfriend's daughter's dog. And and so he they were all going to go run into the woods after it. And so some of them did. And one uh, in particular, one brave soul kind of went a little too far in and he ended up turning around. There was nobody around him. And he heard crunching and snapping. And he sees this blackish gray looking creature um eating something, okay, assuming that that's, it was probably this uh, poor pet, you know, and it turns and it growls at him and, it, and, it, and they said the growl kind of went into it like a, like a roar and it went through his body and gave him a headache and a nosebleed and he turned and he ran back into the party and according to Jerry, he had, you know, what, urinated so? himself. Yeah, urinated on himself and and he he's just collapsed and was like, dude, there's something out there. There's some kind of wolf out there, you know, and so everybody just kind of got away from the clearing and there was this horrific thing that happened at the Kitsunietta. And so, you know, of course, nobody's going to want to go out there and have get togethers, you know, and don't go to Jerry's place because you're going to, you know, some, some werewolf's going to eat your dog. Um, you know, so all this stuff had happened to Jerry, like the, the thing with the thing in the tree and then the, the thing under the truck. But to me, I, I think the thing with the truck was probably one of the most terrifying, but he, I asked him, I said, what was the scariest thing that happened to you? And Jerry was very adamant that it was this one encounter that happened to him. What's so bizarre is that I had, you know, when me and Nellie had gone over this story, uh, not even a month later, uh, a, a family friend of their, of hers had come to town and we went to dinner and he described an encounter like this that was almost identical. And now I know me and you, we filled the reports of this that sound very similar to this. And you're going to probably agree when I tell you this. Uh, he said he was asleep at night and then he, he was awakened by a scratching noise by the window on the side of the house. And he's like, what, what the heck is that? And he opens his eyes and he sees a shadow look, looking thing moving around by the window. And at first he thought it was inside the house. And then he realized that whatever it was, was removing the screen. And he was like, what 
the heck? And so he's sitting there staring at it for a minute. And he had, he says, I sleep with the fire right by my bed. And so I take it and I look and I just point it right at the, the window. And he says, when I do, you know, whatever was on the other side of the window, behind the blinds, whatever, the, the curtain. Stop messing with it. Stop messing with it. And he goes, how could it know that I was pointing a gun at it? And he said, so I knew it was something supernatural. And so he goes, okay. So I sit there and I'm just like, all right, dude, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. And and eventually this thing starts to go back up to the window and messing around with it again. And and he, like he had lowered his weapon at that time and he woke up his wife and she kind of looked at him and said, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then went right back to sleep. She was obviously just out of it. And he, he said, it's so weird because just like the incident where he saw the thing by the, by the. Yeah, the thing that terrifies me where it can mess, like just stop people from waking up or keep them in a sleeping state to where it, it just messes with one. Yeah, and, and whenever he, you know, he was talking about that, he goes, how come she didn't wake up? And, and I told him, I said, I don't know, but I've heard that a lot. Yeah, and, um, yeah, and every time I hear it, it freaks me out because it's like, you know, you want, like if something happened at the house, I want to be able to go, like, oh, I can go wake up Wolf. You know, oh, I can go get Anthony, someone to back me up. And to know that someone can block that out for you, mm-hmm. you know, that reliance of your family. What uh, does that sound like, though? It sounds like alien abductions. Yeah. Because that's what happens. And, you know, Tony, we feel that a ton of reports of alien abduction the scenarios. That yeah, are like I was about that. to get to that. Like, mm-hmm. it was like, it reminds me of alien abductions where, you know, no matter what they do, they're the ones that experience this where everyone else is just, you know, they can't get a hold of them. Mm-hmm. And you're sitting there going like, why is this, <laughs> why am I not able to wake this person up? Why is this happening? Um, and, and, and we have had so many reports like that and, and it, it never, it never ceases to amaze me. Um, just how aggravate, I guess, you know, I don't know, like, like how uh, that, it's annoying to, 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 to hear it, you know what I mean? But it never ceases to amaze me how often it happens. Yeah. Um, I did a, I did a, a, a security gig where this woman had claimed that it was a haunting and I haven't actually talked about this on the show cause it's not real. It, it's a very minor thing really. But, um, every, every night, and I know you've heard this, Tony, I've told you this, there was an, a, when I was working out by the lake, starting my business. Uh, there was an old lady who I was working with, and I think she was more just lonely and wanted one of us to be there. We'd play cards with her and stuff. And uh, her house was haunted. And at about 3 a.m. every day, we would hear this, um, like, the the toaster go off, clink, you know, whatever. And her husband had this habit of waking up about 2 or 3 in the morning and going to the kitchen and, and making him breakfast, you know. And then he would read the paper, and he'd be up for a few hours, and he'd go back to sleep for a couple of hours and it was like he did this every day and yeah, so while and after I, he passed yeah it he, was still happening was and still, I was yeah. hearing and I would hear the the slippers go across the floor and it this. wasn't scary to me because I knew what it was it was him yeah it, it was so like that was very comforting but like you know imagine waking up and it's like you're hearing all this stuff and then you're laying right next to you is you know someone your your comfort and you just can't get any help any from help them. from them yeah well he, here's what that has to do with this when when that would happen, I would tr- I, the first time I would go to her, Miss Edith, and I would tell her, "Hey, you know, um, I'm hearing noises," and I try to wake her up, and she would just not wake up. She would just not wake up, and and I would I tried over and over again, um, but any other time, you know, I could just walk down the hallway doing my round, and she'd wake up. And I told her whenever this is happening, you know, and when then when I told her what it was, because at first I didn't know what it was. Um, but I had an idea, you know, and then, and then she said, well, that my husband would get up. And, and so I told her, I said, every time I, this happens, but I try to wake you up so you can come hear it and you can, you don't wake up. And so, and, and so she was like, yeah, you know, and she wasn't a really, and, and they weren't that old. He, I think he was like 68 or something, um, when he passed uh, the heart attack. And so, and she was like 67. So she wasn't like, um, they weren't like, you know, super old people or anything like that. It was you know, he, he was a smoker and a drinker, you know, and, and, but he didn't drink a lot, but she said the smoking was a big problem. Um, but I would sometimes walk in there and I would smell cigarette smoke and I told her, you know, and, but whenever that would happen, I, I would always try to get her to, to wake up, to go hear it. And I could never get her to wake up. And, and so, and it happened to a couple of the other guys that worked for me too. Uh, I think Bones might've worked there. Um, I think it, it might've been him uh, or I know Scorpion. 
but anyway, it was just a weird thing that went on. And, and so, yeah, you get into this, uh, it's aggravating when you're- it's like a lull or something. Yeah, they can't, like, they can't snap out of whatever is, you know, so it's like, it's just for you. Like you're in that zone and they're, it's not meant for them, you know? So anyway, you know what? That's, that's all the time we have for tonight. <laughs> I know I left it on a, on a cliffhanger there, folks. And so I'm going to get into this uh, scary encounter and I'm going to finish it on next week's episode. So folks, uh, from everybody here at PRT, thank you for listening and the exciting conclusion to this, uh, story will, will be, will be next Friday. Thank you for being here for the return of Mushu. <laughs> the return to the return to Hernandez Ranch, re revisited, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and then, you know, of course, Mushu's tri- tri- uh, triumphant return. And, and so we're going to talk about Jerry's, we're gonna uh, finish encounter. it up. Definitely. Yeah. We're going to finish it up, but folks, uh, so I, I know I left you hanging, but you know, we're at the hour. And so just, uh, be stay tuned and next Friday we'll get into this. And thank you for listening. Check out the Tuesday live stream and we can do a Q and a, and we can talk about this episode when, when it airs and you guys can, we can talk about it. Uh, but from everybody here at PRT, good night. <laughs>